What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Wizarding Fire Drive Radio. My name is Jeremy. I'm joined by my good friend, Andrew Adams, and we are here to talk to you about martial arts, specifically teaching to the test. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? This is a subject that came up uh, a few episodes ago, and we're going to go deeper into this. If you're new to what we do, please visit WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for all the things that we do on this show. This, the number one traditional martial arts podcast in the world, as well as Whistlekick.com. We are here to support you, the traditional martial artist, whatever you train, wherever you train, why, how, whenever you train. We believe wholeheartedly in the six freedoms of martial arts. You can learn more about those at Whistlekick.com. And you can catch us all over the country at various events. And you can find fun apparel and training programs and all kinds of great stuff for students, as well as a variety of resources for martial arts schools like Whistlekick Alliance and a variety of information guides. Many of them are free. So check out all that good stuff at all the places that seem to make sense. So, Andrew. Teaching to the test. When when I hear this phrase, I think of I think of uh, high school. Mm-hmm. I think of this very simplistic uh, formula that a number of my teachers had, which was they knew what was going to be on the test. They would reverse engineer the test and make sure we learned that material and only that material. And it was really an expectation of memorization. Yeah. Less so than understand. Memorization, not retention. Yeah. Yeah. Read, write, regurgitate. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's fairly common in schools these days. Yeah. Uh, Well, I mean, it's been a little while since you and I have been in high school. But I don't think it's changed. Because it was in place before us, right? But it seems like it's gotten worse, right? Because how do you evaluate the quality of a teacher? Well, mm. standardized testing is a big component of that. And if you know yeah, yeah. that your job depends on a certain metric that comes out of that test, it's only natural that you're going to prioritize the results of that test in lieu of yep. other evaluation yep. criteria. But that doesn't just happen in an English class or a science class or a Latin class. It often happens in martial arts classes, but there's a different aspect here. And that is that in most cases, the test is determined by the same person determining the curriculum and the lesson plans. So it becomes a little bit more complicated of a discussion. Yeah, yeah. That person <clears throat> in the school system is often, depending on the the, the curriculum, it, it, depending on the class, is not coming up with the curriculum that they're going to be teaching, or um, they have a broad understanding. You know, like I could see in an English class, for example, they they might have some say in terms of what books are going to read and whatever, but. Um, when you have a test at the end that is going to be on this, 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 and this, they have to make sure that they teach this, 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 and this, so that when the students take the test, they can answer those questions correctly. Right. Right. So when we we use the phrase teaching to the test, I think a lot of people have in immediate negative connotation. Admittedly, I do too. When, when we pose this, this question, should a martial arts school be teaching to the test, I become resistant right off the bat. Yeah. But I don't know that I should. I don't know that it's fair. And maybe it's because of my experience with that in, in public school. Sure. And, and that makes sense. And, and I get it. I, I, I get, it gets my hackles raised a little bit. So I understand where you're coming from. If, and, and what's really interesting about this, we, we've talked a bit over the last year and a half about my martial arts school and some of the things that I'm doing differently 
And one of them, for example, is I have a dramatically simplified cur curriculum. Mm -hmm. Are there plenty of things that my students are going to learn that I do not evaluate them on? Yes. Does that mean I don't care if they learn them? No. For me, our testing is based on determining their competency of the most important things, the things I will not compromise on, mm -hmm. the things that I believe if they check those boxes, other things that can be a lot more individualized are possible. So do I teach to the test? Yeah, I do. Mm. Because the curriculum was developed in such a way that the, the test is basically the curriculum. But I would make the argument that in, me in many schools, that might not be the case. I think in, in many, even most I don't know if I want to say most in many schools curriculum is this big and to properly mm -hmm. evaluate that material would take longer than the test is permitted to be. Correct. So it's either simplification or mm -hmm. random. Yep. Now, if it's random, it becomes really hard to teach to the test. Yep. Yep. But if it's, if you know what's on the test and testing is coming, <clears throat> And you are prioritizing test elements over things that outside of testing you would say are equally important. I think that's a problem. Yeah. I think the place where I experience it is schools where, and I've seen this in a multitude of schools where will you'll go to class for months and you'll lur you'll wor lurk lurk. You'll not lurk. You will work. <laughs> I was, it, so lurk was a combination of learn and work. I put them together. <clears throat> Sorry. So you'll work on maybe, you know, forms, applications or techniques on this or that or the other thing. And then, oh, test is coming up in two weeks. Okay, we got to get basics. Let's do blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks. No strikes. We're going to do them in this order because the school does them in that certain order and you have to demonstrate them that way. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the test and those are the things you show. But for the last two and a half months, you've worked on forms applications or these other techniques. And those things aren't even on the test, but the test is coming up. So for two weeks, you work on the test and then the test is over. And OK, let's go back to the forms applications and techniques and things. What what that makes me think when you talk about that is that the instructor is disconnected from the curriculum. They don't believe the curriculum is a direct reflection over what they feel is most important for those students at that yeah. stage in their education. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a problem. Yeah. I, and, and I will admit, I, I have been a victim. Uh, uh, I've been a victim of this. I've been the student and I have been the teacher that is like, Oh shoot. I, this is testing month. And you know, it wasn't my school. I didn't run the school, but I was one of the instructors, excuse me. And I was like, I got to get, I want to make sure that these students look good for sensei. Let, let's start working on stuff that I know is going to be on the test. Um, and I feel bad about that. Like I, it shouldn't take there being a test to work on those things. Those should, things should be on an ongoing thing. Right. And, and it, I think for a lot of schools, it be, the, the, the problem comes in in that the curriculum is far too large. There are a lot of schools out there that as soon as they come up with some good stuff, it becomes a requirement. Yeah. And that's a problem because everything can't be in the curriculum. And here's why everything can't be in the curriculum. Because the more you ask people to know, the less well they will know any one thing. Absolutely. That, that is a fact. If you expect that by adding material to your curriculum means your students are going to spend additional time training on their own, you are sorely mistaken. Yeah. They I mean, have a how finite many... amount of time they're going to invest in their training, both at home and in class. 
And the more material you ask them to learn, the more diluted their time is on any of those specifics. Correct. How many people have heard the phrase quality over quantity? Right. This is the perfect example. Yep. Now, it's interesting because when, when you go back to the writings of many of the, f the founders of various styles that we have today, they preached this. Funakoshi said, you need three katas. Yeah, but then he, but that, but Shotokan's got 26 katas in there. But, and that's my point. Yeah, yeah. Right? There's a disconnect in there. Yeah. And if you talk to most people that have been training a long time, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, they tend to agree. Doesn't mean they don't like forms. Doesn't mean they don't know dozens of them. Yeah, yeah, sure. But do they need that many? Do you need 400 ways to respond to a straight punch? You don't need them, right? Mm -hmm. What when, when I started my school, I worked backwards from the question, what is most important for my students to know at any given stage? What do I what, what is what does a great yellow belt look like? What skills do they have? What is most important? Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't that top tier of importance, it either got bumped up to blue belt or thrown away. Yep. And I have a rotation of concepts that we teach and a rotation of, of material. It's not quite a rotating curriculum, but it's similar. And it has worked really well mm -hmm. because they get to focus on things. Now, sometimes that plethora of material comes in because instructors don't know how to make the same material fun. Yeah. Yep, they only know fair. one way to teach it and it becomes boring. So they're like, all right, I got to come up with, uh, I got to give them something else. Or maybe you just need to be a little more creative in how you present that material. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, one of the things we talked about last week is having a different teacher because they teach things a different way. That's a skill you can learn is how to teach the same thing different ways. Like here, here's a perfect example. <coughs> teaching down blocks, right? And and this is something I haven't necessarily done in an adult class, but in a kid's class, yep, they're practicing down blocks, great. Turn to the side, okay, great, it's different because you're facing a different direction. Lay on the floor, facing up, you're staring at the ceiling, now you're doing down blocks, right? You're They're still practicing down blocks, but it's a different way of teaching the same thing. Carry that over to other things. Maybe it's, I'm not saying do everything laying on the floor, but find different ways of teaching the same thing so that you don't have to find 45 things to practice. You can practice 20 things in 45 different ways, as an example. Right. Right. There, it, I could, you've done this, I could make a whole class out of teaching that one block. Yep. I'm not going to because that's not going to move my students forward at the rate and in the way that I want them to move forward. Sure. But if we're just talking about enjoyment, I could come up with an hour long class. It was just low blocks. Yep. Absolutely. Conditioning, standing in place, laying down, moving around, uh, moving on command, stepping backwards and doing it. Uh, one person steps in and throws a low block. You could think of it as a hammer fist. The other steps back and blocks it with a low block, mm -hmm. right? What if low block isn't exactly low what if it's mid-level what if it's head level what if we're using it as one step or three steps sparring yeah. right there are so many things that we can do with that one technique that can make it exciting and different and in fact i would argue that most instructors throw too much material and they dilute out the brilliance of that one technique or that one form or that one whatever yep by yep. asking students to learn too much and so students don't get the nuance the depth that they really could the detail in that technique or form or whatever yeah absolutely absolutely so learning <coughs> multiple ways to do the same thing is is a great teaching tool for sure now, does that mean every one of those ways to do that have to be evaluated on the test? No. 
I would say for for most, let, let's 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 say bl- take black belt for example, right? Because most schools have a even though they implement it differently, a black belt generally means you know this thing. Yeah. Right. Whatever material is, is 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 taught to you prior to black belt, you're usually expected to know it and know it well. So if we continue that example of of low block, does that student, that black belt candidate, need to go through an hour long black uh, uh, downward block class to prove that they have a good understanding of a downward block? Not necessarily. No, no. Could they, if they've been through that that downward block class once or twice at some point in the last few years, could they on the fly be asked, hey, do this with your downward block? Mm-hmm. How many people out there who've been training a while have never done a downward block while laying on their ble- on their back and can imagine what that feels like and they can imagine, mm-hmm. oh, okay. So I'm going to lose. I don't really have the ability to rotate with that. That's going to feel a little funny. Uh, the balance of my hand, it's probably going to drift up, right? Like I've never done that, but I can imagine what that feels like. Mm-hmm. And if I was evaluated in that way at a test, it's going to show my understanding. Yeah, yeah. Right. When we, when we talk about testing <laughs> as checking a box, do you have this degree of competency on, on this thing? Forms. We, we did an episode a long time ago. I think this was before you joined the show. Talking about forms and all the different ways you could train a form. Mm-hmm. Doing it, you know, mirror, backward, you know, reverse. Doing it without hands. Doing it without feet. Doing it in a, in a pretend phone booth. Yep. If you really know a form, how many of those do you have to demonstrate to prove you really know it? Yeah, How many does, people definitely. out there just learn to form and they can do it reverse? Oh, yeah. You've got to know that form really well to do that. Yeah, yeah, it's really hard. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in fact, uh, I mean, we're, we're going on a bit of a tangent here from teaching to the test, but uh, doing things on the opposite side is really hard. Most weapons forms, most Kobudo what you know okinawan weapons would be kobudo most of those forms are all right-handed and there are moves that you never ever do on the left and when you start to like work them it's like wow this feels why is this so weird oh because i never do it on this side so yeah now if you're gonna learn and and i I think i don't quite think this is much of a tangent as, as you think it is because how does someone learn how to do the left? They refer back to the right. They refer back mm-hmm. to, okay, so it goes like this on this side. Okay, I got to do it like this on this side. You've got to be able to do it well on the first side before you can do it on the other side. Sure. Right? And so if I wanted, if you gave me, you gave me black belt candidates and I understood your curriculum and I understood what was expected of, of those students to be black belts. I could test them, maybe without the cardio stuff, maybe without some of the the um, the resilience, the overcoming that is common in in testing. But if I just wanted to evaluate their competency of skill, mm-hmm. I could do that in fifteen minutes. Sure, right? I could say, okay, so what's your first form? All right, uh, I want you to do it last move to first move, and then I want you to do it mirror. Yeah. That's going to show me pretty much everything I need to know about someone's <clears throat> basic forms. I can see in there, okay, so they're uncomfortable, they're unpracticed. What do their stances look like? Yeah, yep. That's a that's a default stance for them because mm-hmm. now they're uncomfortable. Okay, the stances Correct. look good, the techniques look good. They're unsure, but by by unsettling them, I'm getting a more authentic view of who they are as a martial artist, right? Yeah. But that, but a lot of schools would say, okay, at your black belt test, you're going to do your form and you're going to have to do it last move to first move. And you're going to have to do it in mirror. And you're going to have to do all these other uh, uh, implementations of that form. You're going to have to do it in a pretend phone booth. You're going to have to demonstrate the application with somebody else. Okay. 
But the problem comes in when you run all of those for purpose of the test, you run the risk of it being that, and this is where we go back to the beginning, that read, remember, regurgitate, right? That yep. memorization rather than that understanding. Understanding. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think that that is really important. And I think if, you, if your curriculum does not leave space for personal understanding, you are depriving your students of the ability to truly grow as individual martial artists and you're turning them into robots. Yeah, yeah. And if your goal is to make them robots, that's fine. Great. But yeah. most instructors I, mean, if, I know if that's don't what you want. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, if that's what you want, there's nothing wrong with that. Just know that that's what's, what's happening. That's all. Have we missed anything? Probably. And if we did, I hope that our listeners and viewers on YouTube will let us know. I felt like this one meandered a little bit more, but it's, it's a, it's a tough subject. Yeah. Right. This would be, if, if we were evaluating a specific school with a specific curriculum and specific, specific testing requirements, that would be a lot easier for us to talk about. Here's where we're seeing the gaps. Yeah. But because we're looking at this from a, a, a 800 foot view of martial arts schools in general, knowing that we have schools on, on in, that do things so dramatically differently, mm -hmm. it can it's it's really tough for us to say A B C because you determine so much. <clears throat> yeah. And my hope is, and, and I think I'll I can speak for you too, Andrew. Our hope is that. In, in watching or listening to this episode, you take a step back and you say, all right, when my students get to the test, do they know what I need them to know? Or are there things that are missing? If they're did missing, they to, I, yeah. I was going to say, did they have to cram to get there? Yeah. If there, if there are things that are missing, then maybe my time between testing is off. Maybe I've got too much material. Maybe I'm going too far off curriculum mm -hmm. during my classes. There's nothing with bonus material. My students have bonus material. I'll tell them like, this is bonus. This is yep. not part of the curriculum, but we've naturally ended up in this place. And I want to spend 10 minutes talking about it mm -hmm. because I think they'll get value out of that. Right. But I, I want you to take a step back and ask yourself, am I, is the ABC, is it lined up well? And if it's not, it's okay to change it. Whether that means you find more efficiency in how you present the material or you res remove some of the material. Maybe you have a longer test. Maybe you wait longer between tests. Sure. There's no right all, answer. All of those things are options. So like Andrew said, if you have feedback for us, Jeremy at Andrew at whistlekick.com. You can leave a comment under the video at YouTube. Hopefully you're watching these episodes because we have a lot of fun and we have make funny faces sometimes. And so you can, you know, you can see us make funny faces. Okay. Uh, <laughs> if you are not subscribed, make sure you're subscribed everywhere. Subscribe on YouTube, turn on notifications. We release Monday and Thursday. If you love what we do, please consider supporting us. Patreon.com slash whistlekick, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick. Five bucks a month. We'll tell Buy you. Buy us a coffee. There's a literal surface, though, called bias a coffee, so it's not that. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't yeah, even know that. Yeah. Okay, don't do that for me because I don't like coffee. Uh, but we, we give you a bunch of bonus stuff behind the scenes. It's the only place you're ever going to find out who and what topics are upcoming on the show. Uh, we're getting better about releasing uh, bloopers. Andrew cuts out some of the silly things that happen, either with these episodes or with guests. So if, if you really enjoy the show, consider supporting us. It's five bucks a month. There's, there are tiers that are higher than that, but that's, that's the low end. And it goes a long way. We still, this show is still not profitable. Whistlekick as a company is by a little bit. The show is not. And your support in doing so would, would help us cross that threshold. Anything else we want to say? All right. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.